Welcome. Thank you for joining us for First Person Conversations with Holocaust Survivors. I'm Bill Benson, and I have hosted First Person since it began at the museum in 2000. Each month, we bring you firsthand accounts of survival of the Holocaust. Each of our first person guests serves as a volunteer at the museum. Holocaust survivors are Jews who experienced the persecution and survived the mass murder that was carried out by the Nazis and their collaborators. This included those who were in concentration camps, killing centers, ghettos and prisons, as well as refugees or those in hiding. Holocaust survivors also include people who did not self-identify as Jewish, but were categorized as such by the perpetrators. During our program, please send us your questions and tell us where you are watching from in the live chat. We are honored to have Holocaust survivor Aryeh Efraf share his personal firsthand account of the Holocaust with us today. Aryeh, thank you so much for joining us and your willingness to be our first person. Thank you, Bill, for inviting me to this program. Aryeh, you have so very much to share with us today in a short time, so we'll, we'll start right away. Your parents were married in Slovakia in 1941, almost two years after World War II began in September 1939. Before we turn to what happened to you and your family during World War II and the Holocaust, please introduce us to your parents, starting with your father, and tell us what you know of their lives before you were born. Uh, thank you. This is a photograph taken uh, long before the war uh, of my father's family uh, with my grandfather and grandmother in the center. Uh, my father was one of six boys and two girls in the family. He's standing in the back row on the left. Uh, the, my uncle Lazar uh, is also in the back row, uh, second from right. And later in the program, I would like to say something about Lazar as well. Uh, uh, not everybody in the family is in this picture. There is one sister and one brother who did not make it to the picture. Uh, I do want to point out that from this family, uh, eight members of this small family were uh, uh, murdered during the Holocaust. Aryeh, tell us about your father's business. My grandfather owned the only general store in the little town that they lived in a town named Bardiov in the east of Slovakia. A general store is basically a, a mini or a micro department store. It's a small store and it has a little bit of almost anything. Uh, and my father and one of his brothers uh, worked with my grandfather in that store that provided the family with a reasonably comfortable living. And what about your mother? Tell us about her and her family. My mother uh, was born in Hungary. Uh, she and her family uh, lived in a town named Bereksaz, which at the time uh, was part of Hungary. Uh, since then, it had been taken over by the Ukraine, and it is in the Ukraine to this very day. Um, uh, she was one of four children. She had one sister and two brothers. Uh, her father, my grandfather, was a, a lumber merchant. And my mother uh, was a very non-typical uh, Hungarian young woman in that she worked with my father. She was uh, with my grandfather. She was both his uh, bookkeeper, uh, his office manager. Uh, she used to uh, take trips to the forests to mark the trees that need to be cut down to be made into lumber. She used to run up and down the lumber uh, piles in the lumber yard to count the lumber, to keep account of everything. Uh, she was quite active in that, uh, which was uh, very unusual for a young uh, uh, Hungarian woman at that time. Uh, 
And this this is a very striking photograph of her, which I think was from before the war. This was before the war. She's probably around 20 or 22 years old. So tell, uh, me how, tell us how she met your, your father. Um, the, once, once the uh, uh, Ukraine was taken over um, during the war, uh, Jews in Bereksaz were deported uh, and they had to leave everything behind, uh, leave, leave town with basically the clothes on their back. Um, and uh, my mother's family uh, found refuge in a, a town, in a city, in uh, the Czech Republic uh, named Brno. They moved to Brno. Uh, this is uh, my mother's family. She's sitting in front with my grandfather, uh, her grandmother, my grandmother, her mother is standing behind her and then her uh, younger sister, Dutsi. Uh, the two brothers are not in the picture. Um, my, both of my grandparents in my mother's family and the youngest of the brothers also perished in the Holocaust. Um, the family uh, tried to make a living in Brno and then uh, the Czech Republic deported Jews from the Czech, Czech Republic, and they found refuge in a small town in Slovakia, a small town named Preshov, uh, which is next door to the town where my father lived, Bardiov. Uh, when they arrived in the town, the uh, delegation of the local Jewish community met them uh, to try to uh, help them get get settled. Uh, and as they were sitting around and talking, my grandmother was bemoaning the fact that she had two unmarried daughters that she needed to marry off. And now that they are completely have lost everything they ever had, uh, how is she going to marry uh, those daughters when they have no dowry? Uh, in Europe at the time, the bride was expected to bring into the marriage a dowry of uh, 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 home appliances, uh, bed sheets, uh, tablecloths, that kind of stuff. Um, one of the locals uh, heard her and said, well, you know, I happen to know a family in nearby Bardiov. Uh, they are reasonably well off. They have a son who is in his early 30s and he's still not married. They are beside themselves about that. Uh, he wouldn't care about the dowry. He doesn't. He probably doesn't need that. Uh, maybe we can have those two meet and see what happens. And so my grandparents invited my father for Friday night dinner in Preshov, and they met, and uh, something did happen. Something did happen, absolutely. Um, Arye, before we continue, I'd like to let you know that there are people watching and listening to you today from all over the country and indeed the world. So we have viewers today in South Carolina, Minnesota, Iowa, and Colorado. And welcome to our international viewers from Argentina, Croatia, Ecuador, and Denmark. You were born April 7th, 1942. From the moment you were born, your life was in danger. The first wave of deportations of Jews from Slovakia had begun just weeks earlier. Tell us about what happened with your family on the day you were born. Um, in 1942, the year I was born, uh, Slovakia was still an independent country. It had not been invaded by uh, the Nazis yet. It, that would happen two years later. But the government of Slovakia, and especially the president of Slovakia, uh, a Catholic priest by the name of uh, Josef Tiso, uh, he was a great admirer of the, of the Nazis, and he tried to emulate them. Uh, and Slovakia became the first, and as far as I know, the only country in Europe who collaborated with the Nazis to the 
extent that they deported their own Jewish citizens into the Nazi concentration camps. Uh, and uh, this started in the spring of 1942. And the day that I was born uh, was also the day of the first transport uh, of deported Jews from Bardio to a recently opened uh, extermination camp in nearby Poland. In uh, fact, in fact, Arie, if I could just jump in for a minute, um, that spring and then uh, in, in lasting into the summer, Slovak authorities rounded up tens of thousands of Jews, interned them, and then handed them over to the German authorities. They were transported under terrible conditions from Slovakia to Auschwitz, Lublin, uh, Majdanek, Sobibor, and other locations in German-occupied Poland, where the vast majority of them were murdered. How were your parents able to avoid deportation? On the day, on that day, uh, the uh, order went out in Bardio for uh, a list of Jews uh, to report to the train station uh, to be deported to Auschwitz. Um, my mother was in labor with me and she could not uh, possibly comply. Uh, instead, she hid in the basement of my parents' house and uh, she gave uh, birth to me with the help of uh, our uh, housekeeper, Maria. Um, my father refused to comply and uh, he and quite a few other uh, Jews in Bardiov uh, escaped. Uh, they fled to the forest surrounding Bardiov and hid in the forest until, uh, until darkness. Uh, and after darkness, he came back home to find out that he became a father. My mother's obstetrician, uh, Dr. Rudolf Radach, uh, he was not Jewish. Uh, he was Catholic, uh, but there was a rumor in town that he had some Jewish blood in him. And based on that rumor, he was included in the list of people to report mm -hmm. to, uh, to the train station. He also fled to the woods outside of Bardiov and came back uh, after darkness to uh, minister to my mother and help her out and take care of her. And Arye, your, your father, once um, the, he came back and, and your mother gave birth, he ended up being allowed to continue running his store because it was important uh, to the livelihood of the community. And uh, tell us a, a lit, just a little bit about that. Uh, this was the only, their store was the only store of its kind in Bardio. And the town depended, depended on the uh, services of the store. And so the authorities granted my father a certificate uh, called the uh, Wichtige Jude, which means uh, an important or essential Jew. Uh, and that certificate protected him from that point on, uh, from exempted him from being deported uh, for as long as the certificate was in, was in force. Mm -hmm. He did not cover his family though, and uh, my mother and me. So, that, um, so after about a year, um, after your birth, living under those circumstances, your parents realized it was no longer safe for you and your mother to remain in Slovakia. So your parents decided to have your mother take you to Hungary while your father remained in Bardiov. How, how did they manage, how did your mom and your father figure out how to get you over the border into Hungary? My father arranged for my mother to have uh, forged uh, identity papers presenting her as a non-Jewish single woman. Uh, and since she was native Hungarian, uh, they figured that being in Hungary probably would be the best place for her at the time with me. 
uh, they hire a local woman who made her living by smuggling uh, refugees across the border between Slovakia and Hungary uh, to take me over the border. Uh, she tried once at night and she was caught. Uh, they had to bail her out. And then she tried again and she was caught again. And they had to bail her out again. And for the third time, my mother decided to take things into her own hands. Uh, she gave me a sleeping pill. I was maybe a year old. She gave me a sleeping pill, uh, put me in a large uh, pillowcase and uh, put me over her shoulders uh, and uh, crossed the border into Hungary with me. And, and this photo, um, Arie, I think was taken right about that time, wasn't it? That was, that, that was taken right before. Yeah. Before she left Ardi of to, to, just, to just think about that, you're, after two failed attempts, knowing the risks and the, uh, the unlikelihood of success, your mom, incredible bravery, puts you in a pillowcase and carries you herself over the border. That's just extraordinary. So she makes it over the border. What, what did she do with you and her once she was in Hungary? Well, uh, of course, she couldn't keep me with her because she was supposed to be a single lady. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. She found a Catholic orphanage, uh, in Budapest, uh, which was run by an elderly pediatrician, uh, a, lady, a lady named uh, Agnes Parzer, Dr. Agnes Parzer. Uh, uh, Dr. Parzer was a very strict disciplinarian. Uh, uh, her, uh, her idea of raising uh, little children uh, was uh, that if you don't eat your spinach at lunch, then you will get the same spinach again at dinner. And if need be, then tomorrow, the next day at breakfast, until you decide that you like spinach. Um, and she had never been married. And so she agreed to take me in and keep me in the orphanage. Uh, she did not allow my mother to come and visit me. And perhaps she was right about that, about not getting me upset each time my mm -hmm. mother left. Uh, so uh, my mother made it a habit. Uh, there was a small park across the street from uh, Dr. Parzer's uh, orphanage. And uh, there were a couple of benches in the park. And she would come every day and sit on one of the benches and uh, hope that her little boy would show up through the window or maybe on the terrace while he's playing with the other kids. Arie, tell us how your mom was surviving herself while she was there during that time. Um, the law in Hungary and basically everywhere in Slovakia, everywhere in Europe, was that uh, 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 renters, uh, 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 house renters, needed to report to the police about each new uh, person uh, that they are renting to. Uh, and my mother knew that, and she knew that it would take a police, the police, approximately maybe a month, three weeks or a month, to realize that her papers were forged. And so she would rent a room or an apartment and uh, uh, pay the rent uh, for the month ahead of time. And then she would stay there for three weeks and then skip the place uh, and go to another part of town and rent another place in another police precinct. And that's the way that she stayed ahead of the law uh, for about a year. Mm -hmm. the year that we were in Hungary. And, and during that year that you were in Hungary, and your, as well as your mother, of course, do you know what that time was like for your father and his family in Slovakia? Uh, things were getting worse and worse in Slovakia. Uh, the uh, Nazis did not, uh, did not uh, uh, invade Slovakia yet. 
but the government, as, as I said, was very pro-Nazi, uh, and there was a very large uh, increase uh, in the fascist uh, uh, feelings among the populations. Uh, my uncle, Lazar, who, uh, whom I pointed out in the picture, um, he was married, he had a little boy named Tommy. Uh, one evening he was uh, walking home, uh, back from work uh, on the main, main street. Uh, he was confronted by a gang of young Slovak fascists uh, who demanded to know whether he was Jewish. Uh, and he confirmed that indeed he was. Uh, uh, at which point they beat him to death uh, with uh, bats and with uh, uh, axe handles. Now, of course, Slovakia had a law against that kind of behavior. Uh, if those young punks had killed a stray dog that way on the main for on the main street, uh, the police would uh, hunt them down and bring them to justice. But in the case, in this case, since the victim was uh, just a young Jew. Uh, they did not see any public interest in pursuing it, and they closed the case. Arie, before we continue, I'd just like to remind our audience uh, to please share any questions that anybody has for you uh, via the chat feature that that we have on the on the program. In in August 1944, German troops invaded Slovakia to combat resistance groups. They eventually began organizing roundups and deportations of Jews. At that time, your father decided it was time for the family to find a more secure hiding place. Tell us where your father uh, took the family and how did he find a place to go? My father, uh, even though he didn't have much of a formal education, uh, was one of the smartest and sharpest people I have ever, I've ever known. Uh, he was a realist and he could see what was happening. Um, so he did some research. I, to, that day, to this day, I don't know exactly how he managed to do that. Uh, and he found out that there was one village in Slovakia, in Western Slovakia, named Shishov. that uh, was unique in the sense that it never had any Jews among its population. And that was very unusual because by that time, Jews had lived in all of Europe for many hundreds of years. Mm -hmm. And there were Jews living everywhere. Um, but Shishu didn't have any Jews and he thought it was a good place to hide because the Nazis would not bother to go search for Jews in a place that was known not to have any. And so uh, my mother and I and he uh, traveled to Shishov. We were joined also by another Jewish family from uh, Bardiov. Uh, uh, Shlomo Schleindorf was my father's uh, childhood friend since childhood. Uh, and uh, Shlomo Schendorf uh, believed that my father was born under a lucky star, that he was a very lucky person. And uh, he believed that if any Jew in Europe was going to survive this catastrophe, this Holocaust, uh, my father would be the one. And he, wa he wanted to be standing right next to him when that happens. And so he and his wife and their child uh, who was a year older than I, uh, whose name was Victor, but uh, we called him Vicky. They joined us, and the six of us made our way, and I do not know how, uh, from Bardiov on the eastern edge of Slovakia to Shishov on the western edge. 
So after making that journey, the six of you arrive in Shishov. What what happened then? They arrived in Shishov, and they made their way directly to the church, the Catholic Church in Shishov. Uh, this is the church, and it is still standing there, and it still looks very much the same. Uh, they presented themselves to the priest, and uh, they said uh, very clearly, we are Jewish, we are running for our lives, would you hide us? Now that is, that was a very uh, tense and awkward situation to both sides, because the rule, the law under the Nazis was that anybody who hid Jews uh, would be immediately shot. Anybody who helped Jews hide would be immediately shot. Anybody who knew about Jews hiding somewhere and not reporting it to the authorities would be shot on the spot. And not only them, but the rest of their families. And sometimes in a village, uh, the Nazis would actually set the entire village on fire on, his, on its inhabitants, uh, on the theory that uh, if the Jews were found in that village, the village inhabitants must have known about that and they didn't report it and therefore they deserved punishment. And so they put the priest in a very awkward position, letting him know who they were. Of course, they put themselves in a terrible risk because what the priest should have done by the law is immediately report that these Jews are looking to hide. But he didn't. Uh, he said, I will hide you in my church, but I can only hide the adults. Uh, hiding little children is just too risky and I cannot take that risk. So you will have to find some other arrangement uh, for your children. And, and somehow or another, they did. They found some other arrangements. Tell, tell us how they found uh, shelter for you and for Vicky and you're just two and three years old. We are. And they were standing there um, in the church, looking around and trying to figure out what can be done. When my father spotted on the top of a hill right outside of the village, outside of Shishov, on the top of a hill, there was a single home, single house. And he asked the priest who Whose house is that? And the priest explained that that is the village shepherd. He takes care of the sheep and the goats that the villagers raise. Instead of every farmer, every farmer in the village uh, taking care of their own sheep and goats, uh, they appointed one of them, the shepherd, to be a shepherd. Uh, they built him a house outside of the village, downwind, on top of a hill. And uh, that's, the, that's where they keep their sheep and that's where he, where he lives with his family. And my parents and the other family, the Scheindorf, uh, said that is, sounds like a perfect place perhaps um, for the children. And so they trekked their way up the hill and met the shepherd's family. Uh, his name was Jan uh, Mierny. His wife was Irena Mierny. They had four daughters of their own, ranging in age from about six to about 12. And they did the same thing again. They presented themselves. They said, we are Jews. Uh, we might have found a place for ourselves to hide but we are looking for a place for the children. Would you be willing to take the children in with you into your home until the war is over? At that time, this is the fall of 1944. The Allies have already landed in Normandy. The BBC is broadcasting to the European population, hang on, it won't take long, we are coming for you. And so everybody believed 
that the war uh, would be over in a matter of maybe a few weeks, maybe a couple of months. Uh, and so, and the Mierli said, yes, we, are, we will be, uh, we will take care of your children while you are hiding. Uh, they did have Jan, actually. Uh, they did, he had had two conditions to that. And the first condition, he said, uh, everybody in the village knows that we have four daughters. And if they spot little boys running around the house or running around in the yard, that would raise suspicion. So I would like these children of yours to be dressed as girls so they won't stand out among my daughters. And I didn't have any problem with that, and my parents didn't have any problems with that. Uh, Vicky was a year older than I. He was already three. And uh, he had a big problem with being dressed as a girl. He absolutely refused. Um, and so the compromise was reached that uh, Vicky would not leave the house during daylight hours. He would be hiding inside the home uh, while, while it was light outside, and he can, he can come out only after darkness, um, which was inconvenient because the outhouse, of course, mm -hmm. was also outside the house. Uh, but that was the arrangement, and we all agreed to that. Uh, he, Jan, also had, this is Jan in the back, uh, and that is uh, Irena holding uh, Vicky uh, with her right hand and me uh, with her left hand uh, with my doll and my red bow in my hair. Uh, they na named me Anna. Uh, everybody called me Anichka, and that's who I was. I was Anichka Mierny, the, the shepherd's daughter. And there you are again in that picture. And so the idea is dressed as a girl, if you're out in the yard and anybody spots you, they're just going to think you're one of the four daughters. That's exactly right. Uh, Jan had another condition, though, and that was a little bit more difficult. Mm -hmm. Since they didn't have any sons, uh, he wanted my parents to sign a paper giving him and Irena the right to adopt me legally as their own son, should my parents not come for me at the end of the war. Uh, that was very difficult. Uh, first of all, we are Jewish. Uh, they are Catholic. Uh, my parents don't know them. Uh, they are complete strangers. They have just met. Uh, giving your firstborn to complete strangers uh, could not have been a, an easy, easy decision. But they didn't have much of a choice. And they agreed and they signed. And to this day, I think that things, if things have worked out differently, then today I could have been a very successful shepherd in Slovakia. We have a question from a viewer named Mary. And Mary asks, was, was the Mierny family kind to you? And how did you adjust to being living with this new family? Uh, the Mirnis, especially Irena and the daughters, they, they were absolutely great. I, uh, I was very lucky to, uh, to be with them. Um, they treated Vicky and me as their own children. Uh, I did not, uh, very quickly I came to think of them as my parents. I did not really had much, I had not had much contact with my parents before this because I was in an orphanage in Hungary and my father was in Slovakia. Uh, and so I called them mama and papa and uh, they were my mother. I, I considered them my, my, uh, my parents. I played with the sheep and the goats, tried to, the goats were always trying to eat my red bow from my hair, and I had to fight them for that. Uh, I had my chores of feeding the sheep and the goats in the morning. Um, uh, and so I cannot complain 
about the time I had stayed with the Mernes. There were a couple of things that still stand out many years later now, still stand out, out in my memory. One was um, Jan was uh, worried, of course, that somebody might come uh, to the house unannounced and spot uh, Vicky and me there. And so he uh, devised a pro procedure that if anybody uh, is seen approaching the house, he would clap his hand uh, and he would say, Teraz, which means now in Slovak. Um, and Vicky and I had designated hiding places that we would immediately go, go to and hide until he came and told us it was okay to come out. My place of hiding was the coal bin next to the uh, coal burning stove in the kitchen. Uh, that, that was a very large bin, it was full of coal. Uh, and I was supposed to jump in and close the lid over me. Um, I absolutely hated that bin. Uh, it was pitch dark in there. Uh, I was very afraid of that. Uh, the coal, uh, there was dust, it was dusty. The coal has a lot of black dust. I was uh, uh, a neat freak. Uh, liked to be clean uh, and getting this black dust on me was uh, really bothered me a lot. Uh, and, and the coal has a very peculiar odor, a very peculiar smell to it. To this very day, uh, I cannot stand the mm. smell of coal. Uh, so, and I was supposed to be there very quiet until uh, Jan came and picked me up. And I, to this day, I remember those. Also, Jan, uh, every day at the end of the work day, uh, he would walk downhill to the village and meet with his friends in the pub and have a beer or a tour, maybe more than that. And then at the end of the evening, he would come back uphill uh, to the house. We were all asleep by then. He would wake us all up, including his wife, Irena, uh, line us up, take the belt off his waist, and let us have it, uh, just to prove to the family, uh, to remind everybody who is the master of the house. Uh, I have been asked once before, do I hold it against him uh, that he abused his children and, and Vicky and me? And I don't, I really don't. And the reason is because he was a creature of his culture. That was a perfectly acceptable behavior in Slovakia, or at least in small villages in Slovakia at the time. And he just did, know, did not know any better. And the fact that he was brave enough to agree to take the risk of sheltering Vicky and me and saving our life uh, I cut him a lot of slack for that. So I know I don't hold it against him at all. And, and Ari, of course, once your parents and um, the other couple took you and Vicky up to the Mirnies and they took you in, your parents then returned to hide in the bell tower of the church. Despite the priest efforts to protect your parents, they were not safe there for long. Tell us about the conditions for them in the bell tower and then who came to their rescue um, and how they were discovered? Um, they went back down to the church and the priest put them in the bell tower. Uh, the bell tower was open to the elements, of course, because of the bell. Uh, there was a small uh, alcove in there with uh, a straw on the, on the floor and that's where they hid. Um, they were a little worried about that it was already the fall of 1944. Winter was coming. Winters in Europe are very harsh. Um, and as I said, the bell tower was open to the elements. But for the time being, it was a perfect place to hide. 
uh, once, a once a day in the evening, the priest would uh, climb up the ladder, bring them food, uh, bring them water, uh, take down the bucket that they had there to use as a bathroom, and they, were, they would go to sleep there. And during the day, of course, they were supposed to be very quiet, uh, so as not to give their uh, hiding place away. And they were that went on for a few weeks, let's say maybe three weeks. And then one night, uh, right after the priest had left, uh, a strange man came up the ladder and scared the daylight, of course, out of them. And he said, just like I thought, there are Jews hiding there. His name was Jan also, Jan Galko. Turns out that he was the driver of the uh, priest's carriage. The village had given the priest a horse-drawn carriage so he can get around and a person to drive the carriage and take care of the horse. And Jan Galko was that person. Uh, he said that there is a rumor in the village that there are Jews hiding up in the church. And there is a rumor in the village that says that somebody had already notified the authorities and they to the village to search the church. And so he said to my parents and to the Shendors, if I, if I were you, I would not stay here. Now, they didn't know who he was, and they didn't know whether he was telling the truth, and they didn't know it could have been a trap to get them out in the open. Uh, but they didn't have much of a choice. Mm -hmm. They said to him, and what else would you suggest we do? We have no other place to hide. And he said, you come to my home, and I will hide you. And so they walked with him. This is the middle of the night. They walked with him. He lived in a small hut, the very, very last hut at the edge of the of Shishov, with his wife, Pavela, and their four children. And the whole hut inside is one room. Uh, in one corner, there is a stove, and that is the kitchen. In another corner, there are a couple of mattresses on the floor, and that's a bedroom. And that's, that's all there is. That, that was it, just one, one, one room, a one room hut? One room. So, yeah. go ahead. So, and with four kids, um, and yet they insisted on wanting to hide you and the other couple, what, what do you think motivated them to hide the adults and how could they manage that? They insisted that they wanted to hide us. My parents realized this might not work. Those people clearly uh, had a very difficult time feeding themselves and their children, never mind feeding four more adults. Uh, they didn't have room for four more adults. Um, so they, my parents said to them, well, we really appreciate your hospitality and your offer, but we don't see how this is going to work here. So we will find ourselves another place to hide. And thank you very much. And they were turning to leave. Uh, and at that point, uh, Pavela, the, the wife, uh, Jan Galko's wife, who to this point did not say anything, at this point she burst into tears. And my father uh, suspected that he might have uh, insulted her in some way by turning down her hospitality or, or uh, undervaluing her, her, her accommodations. No, no, she said, no, that is not it. She said, I am a good Christian. I have been a good Catholic all my life, and I have always tried to do what I thought Jesus wanted me to do. Jesus here gave me, gives me an opportunity 
to save the lives of four strangers and you are trying to deprive me of that opportunity. Mm -hmm. And so they didn't have any counter argument and they, they stayed there. Uh, the next day, uh, uh, Jan and one of his sons uh, dug a shallow ditch under the haystack that he had in his yard for the horse to feed the horse. Uh, they dug a ditch under the haystack, uh, covered it with a couple of pieces of lumber, and uh, the four, four people, the four adults, the Shandors and my parents, uh, went into that ditch. Uh, later, much later, my fa father told me uh, there was not enough room there for them to lie side by side. They had to lie, lie like sardines, uh, one person's head against the other person's uh, feet. Uh, when one person needed to, to turn over, everybody needed to turn over. And that's where they stayed for the next eight months until the war ended in Slovakia in April of 1945. And during that time, I, 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 I'm assuming that they probably because they had to get out of there to get food and relieve themselves. So that was probably all under the cover of darkness. They were allowed out of the, they called it their bunker. They were allowed out of the bunker uh, once a day in the evening after darkness uh, to stretch, to use the bathroom, to, uh, to uh, eat. Uh, and then afterward, uh, they were, uh, they were had to go back into the bunker and uh, to spend the night there. Um, you asked me about the motivation and I want, the, in my opinion, the motivation of the Galkos and the motivation of the Mirnes for taking the risk and hiding Jews when they were not allowed to do that was very different. Um, Jan Galko was a risk taker, a gambler, uh, he hated the fact that the Nazis occupied his country. He hated the Nazis. Uh, and he saw this as a way of sticking it to the Nazis, hiding two Jewish children in his home. That was his motivation, the, the thrill of the risk. Mr. Mirnis, yeah. And the young yeah. Mirny. The Galcos, on the other hand, they were totally moral, totally decent people, as uh, Pavela said, good Christians. They saw it as their duty, as their religious and moral duty to help persecuted people in need. And they did it just for that reason and for no other, taking upon them not, not only great economical hardship, but a risk for the lives of themselves and their family. Uh, nevertheless, I consider both couple, both the Mernis and the, and the uh, Galkos, uh, nothing short of saints. Arie, as you mentioned earlier, when you first, when the families first went to Shishov, uh, there was a feeling the war wouldn't last too much longer, and then it ended up lasting, of course, until the spring of 1945, when the Soviet Red Army drove German forces out of Slovakia right around the time of your third birthday. Tell us what you can about your liberation and then about being reunited with your parents. Um, my parents, of course, came over me, came, came over for me um, uh, at the end of the war. Uh, the, uh, I consider my, my life up to that point to be bookended on each side by, by uh, significant events. The day I was born uh, was the day of the first transport from Bardiov to Auschwitz. Uh, the day I turned three in 1945 uh, was the day that so the Red Army liberated Slovakia. My parents came for me um, and I didn't recognize them. I didn't know them as my parents. Uh, to me, Irena and Jan, were my papa and my mama. Uh, I didn't know who those people were. 
and it took us took us a while uh, to get to know each other and to become a family again. We went back uh, to Bardiov only to find out that Bardiov had about, before the war, a population of about 30,000 people, uh, about 10,000 of those, about a third of the population was Jewish. Uh, it was a very thriving, uh, vibrant community. Uh, we went back to Bardiov to find out that Practically speaking, there was nobody left. Our family was decimated. My grandparents were gone. Uh, my aunts and their families and their children were gone. Uh, and, uh, many of their friends, relatives were gone. And so uh, my parents didn't stay in Bardi of Long. Uh, they moved to a nearby uh, city, the city of Koshitze. And uh, three years later, when uh, the state of Israel proclaimed its independence in 1948. Uh, we emigrated to Israel, and both the Shandors and us emigrated to Israel, and that's where I grew up. I, I have a hunch that Vicky's dad had the same attitude. He's sticking with your dad because he's uh, he views him as, as as born under a lucky star, as you said. They they were friends till they died. And uh, Vicky and I remained friends uh, for a long time. Vicky passed away two, two years ago. Uh, we used to spend uh, the uh, summer vacation from school. Uh, part of the time I was, I, would, I was spending at his home and part of the time spending ours. They lived in a different location in Israel than we did, but we traveled and visited each other and remained friends. Arye, we have a video question from a student named Rose from Reston, Virginia. So let's go ahead and hear from Rose. Hi, my name is Rose and I'm from Reston, Virginia. What was the importance of the Miranese helping you and what can we learn from them? So Rose is asking you, what was the importance of the Miranese helping you and what can we learn from them? It is, it is very important to note that neither, neither the Miernis nor the Galcos were deep thinking philosophers. They were decent people who had the courage and the humanity and the compassion to help persecuted people in need. Uh, we all know that it's important to do that. And we keep saying maybe we, the, the general, we ought to do something about hate in the world, about anti-Semitism, about, about persecution. We need to do something. The government needs to do something. The community needs to do something. The Mirnis did not think that the government or the community or somebody else needs to do something. They clearly believed that it is up to them personally uh, to do the right thing and to help people in need. And uh, uh, that's, that is a very good lesson for all of us uh, to learn. Uh, this is a picture that was taken maybe 40 years, 40 years after the, or maybe more, after the events, um, in the same place where the previous picture of the Miernis was taken, it's me and my late son, Mickey. Mickey was named after his mm -hmm. uncle who died in the Holocaust. And uh, this is Irena Mierni. Uh, we went to visit them. Uh, she was honored. She and uh, her husband, Jan, and the Galkos were honored by uh, Yad Vashem, uh, the organization in Jerusalem that uh, uh, recognizes non-Jews who have helped Jews uh, survive during the Holocaust. They were recognized as uh, uh, the uh, 
righteous among the nations. Uh, it was a very, uh, very uh, touching ceremony. Um, and my entire family came to Slovakia just for the ceremony. It was held in Bratislava, uh, the Slovakian capital, in the state house, and the Israeli uh, ambassador to Slovakia presided. Uh, Irena uh, hooked her hand, her arm, with my, in mine, and just would not let go. Uh, it was a. I was very very happy to see her again, and she was happy to see me again. Arye, um I think um, you, you'll really, really like this. We've been receiving questions and comments from um, viewers, and we even have a viewer today in Shishoff. Many viewers, including Clarice, who's watching on Facebook, and the musician Regina Spector, have written in to ask, were you able to keep in touch with the family who hid you? Obviously, you did for the um, honoring of them by Yad Vashem, but um, to this day, you still have some connections, right? Uh, we do. Uh, I do. Of course, we kept in touch with them. Our our own life in Israel, the early years of the state, uh, was not easy. Uh, so we couldn't really travel to Slovakia to, to visit. Uh, we kept in touch by uh, constant correspondence. Uh, we sent them, of course, presents for every Easter and every Christmas. Uh, uh, we had once annual uh, telephone calls with them. Um, so we kept in touch. And then when things, when life became a little bit more comfortable, uh, I was, by the time I was already an adult, uh, and we could afford it, uh, the whole family, including my brother, younger brother, who was born after the war, and his family, and cousins and so on, uh, we all made a pilgrimage. Uh, to visit them in Slovakia, uh, this was a, it was really a very very uh, emotional uh, reunion. Can only imagine, Arye. I have just one more question for you today, uh, and that is: as we face rising anti-Semitism, related conspiracy theories, and Holocaust denial, please tell us what we can learn from what you experienced during the Holocaust. There, there is a saying that says that if we don't learn from history, uh, we are bound to repeat it. My own view is that there is no if about it. The human race does not have a good record of learning from history. Um, the, we fought a terrible war in World War I. There were millions and millions of casualties. This was, this was proclaimed to be the war to end all wars. And 20 years later, we fought an even more terrible war. And not too many years after that, after uh, America had uh, spent uh, both uh, treasure and blood in Europe with the Allies to defeat fascism in Europe. Not many years after that, we have seen Americans on American soil uh, marching under uh, the swastika banner. I, I, I'm afraid, very afraid, that uh, we don't, the human race, if we don't learn to learn from our history, we will repeat it. On the other hand, um, when my parents came to Shishov with the, with the Shendos, they dealt there with three parties. They dealt with the priest, they dealt with the Miernis, and they dealt with the Galkos. And all three of them were very gracious and courageous in offering help. 
Now, if I had a bag full of coins and I put my hand into that bag and pulled out three random coins and found out that all three are gold, I would not come to the conclusion that I am unbelievably lucky to have found by random choice the only three gold coins in that bag. I would come to the conclusion that it's very likely that the bag is full of gold coins. Maybe all, all the coins in the bag are, are gold. I don't think that my parents were extremely outstandingly lucky to have found the only three parties in Shishov who were courageous and compassionate and decent and humane. It's much more likely that had they met three other parties, probably they would have behaved the same, behaved the same way. Uh, and there is nothing to make Shishov different from any other place on earth. Uh, if that is true about the good people of Shishov, that many of them would have behaved the same way as the Galkos and the Miernis and the priests, then that must also be true about many pe people elsewhere. In fact, there were hundreds, if not thousands, of non-Jews in Europe who risked and sometimes sacrificed their lives to save Jews from annihilation. And so the thought that there are such people who fulfill the Holocaust Museum's motto, which is, what you do matters, that gives me a lot of hope. Th thank you so much. I think that everything you've shared today gives us all hope, um, even under the most horrifying and difficult of circumstances. Um, thank you for being our first person today, um, Arye. Um, just, I, I wish we had had more time, but um, thank you for all that you've shared with us today. Thank you very much for having me, and thank you very much to the Holocaust Museum for organizing this program. I'd like to take a moment to thank our donors. First person is made possible through the generous support of the Lewis Franklin Smith Foundation. And I would also like to invite you to join us for our next program. Please tune in on December 14th, 2022 at 1 p.m. Eastern time for a conversation with Holocaust survivor and museum volunteer, Emmanuel Manny Mandel. Manny was seven years old when the German army occupied Budapest, Hungary where he lived with his family. Join us next month to hear how Manny and his mother spent six months in the Bergen-Belsen concentration camp before finding refuge in neutral Switzerland. Thanks for watching today.